December 4th, 2015. It's a Friday night, and two football players, Nico Kolias and Ani Okiki Iwo, are playing a game of beer pong when suddenly Ani gets a text. He tells Nico that a girl who had friended him on Facebook earlier that week wants to hang out, and the best part about it is that she is a friend. Ani then takes a picture of Nico, sends it to the girls, and a few minutes later they message back saying that they're down to party and they're going to pick up the boys soon. About half an hour later, a blue Dodge Dart pulls up to the house to pick up Ani and Nico, and at first everything seems normal. But as they're driving, Nico notices the neighborhood is getting kinda sketchy. But simultaneously, he's thinking, what could go wrong? Like, we're two football players, pretty big guys. What are they going to do to us? The car then pulls into the driveway of the house, 22 Harvest Street. The girls then lead them in through the side door and tell them to have a seat on the couch. As Nico sits down, he thinks to himself, wow, this place is a mess. The walls are torn up. It smells like urine, maybe feces. Something isn't right. And that's when the lights go out. When Nico Kalias starts school at the University of Rochester in 2012, not only is he looking to further his education, but he's also heavily interested in sports and learning the piano. He takes classes at the renowned Eastman School of Music, and when he's not developing his skills to become a classical pianist, he spends his time on the Rochester football team. And over the next few years, he makes close friendships with many of his fellow players, leading us to that seemingly ordinary Friday night, December 4th, 2015. Ani and Nico are submerged in total darkness. Then, out of nowhere, a group of masked men come bursting through the door, armed with knives, bats, and pipes. They start to surround them, and Nico is freaked out. He leaps to his feet and bolts for the door, but as he makes it just halfway, he feels an immense pressure in his left leg, the same one that he just had surgery on. Nico's just been shot. He struggles to get back to his feet, but he can't. His leg just isn't working. Then the adrenaline takes over and he drags himself to the door and tries to pull the handle, but he can't because there's two girls on the other side jamming it, keeping Nico locked out. He is trapped. Then Nico hears one of the men say, don't fight us, just take it. Don't try and escape. The masked men then start beating the boys. Blow after blow, they take shots of their head, their body. Nico and Ani are outnumbered. 12 against 2. Meanwhile, they are severely confused. They don't know what these guys want, why they're doing this. They don't even know who they are. All they can see is their eyes peering through their masks as they're being assaulted. Nico and Ani are then dragged down the hallway, leaving a trail of crimson behind them on the floor. Ani's picked up and thrown in a bathtub while Nico is cowering in pain balled up in the fetal position on the red stained tile floor. One of the men slams a fluorescent bulb over Nico's head and the glass shatters into his skin. The strangers continue to hit them with several disturbing objects. Electronic hedge clippers, a clothing iron, all while one of the assailants pulls out his cell phone and records the entire thing. I'm in this, I'm in this, this video. There's a video. Recording, homie. This is what I'm gonna do when they take 12 pounds from me. This right here. He ain't got nothing to do with it. He's running. Now remember those last few words because it gives a clue as to why these two were targeted and attacked. One of the skull masks looks at the camera. Meanwhile, you can hear Nico pleading in the background, begging for mercy. Please. This is where things get a whole lot worse. Nico and Ani are bound with duct tape and wire, all while the men are pouring lighter fluid on their bodies and threatening to throw a match on them. This torment proceeds to go on all throughout the night, with details I can't exactly get into, but a few hours later, the men toss Ani in another room and leave Nico on the bathroom floor. And despite his injuries, Nico actually doesn't feel any pain. His survival instincts and willpower are all that's keeping him alive, and while this whole ordeal is happening, he's just thinking about his family. Back home in Chicago, he has his parents and his three brothers, and all he's thinking in this moment is that in the next few months, they will see him walk across that graduation stage. He refuses to even entertain the idea that they will be planning his funeral. Saturday, 
December 5th. No one has seen or heard from Nicholas or his teammate for 12 hours. They're not returning calls, which are now going straight to voicemail, and the two guys, which are always posting what they're doing or where they are on social media, have gone silent. Friends and family notify campus security who call the Rochester Police Department. Investigators there launch an intense manhunt to find the missing football players. They obtain warrants to access their bank transactions, phone records, and social media profiles. In the meantime, they're scouring the campus, searching for people who may have witnessed their disappearance. No one knows the missing students are just four and a half miles away from campus, and their attackers have just returned to start another round of torment. Nico's then forced to take off his clothes. His khaki pants and team jersey cling to his skin, saturated with dark brown spots. He's then shoved into a chair in the bathtub, and as the water comes down from the shower head, the basin changes from clear to dark red. He glances to the side and spots a roll of duct tape with maroon fingerprints, and next to it, a clothes iron. After he's clean, the abusive process repeats all over again. This time though, it's not just physical, but sexual as well, with Nico being forced to do things with the barrel of a rifle shoved down his throat. Eventually, the kidnappers start demanding money. They take Nico's ATM cards and force him to call different banks to increase his withdrawal limits. Thank you for calling Schwab Bank. This is Kim in Denver. How can I assist you today? Hi, this is Nicholas Colius. Hi, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, I just needed a little help with my uh, child Schwab debit card. I really need the money now, so there's no way that I could get the 1500 just uh, transferred over to the debit card. It's impossible to move money on the weekend. Okay, um, that's fine. I guess I'll just call back one day. Okay. Thanks for calling in, sir. You have a great weekend. Eventually, the captors get Nico to give them his PIN number, and they start emptying his accounts. And while this is happening, detectives finally catch a lead in the boy's disappearance. They find that Ani was messaging a girl named Samantha Hughes about potentially hanging out just before their disappearance. Police bring her and her friend Leah in for questioning, and at first they are totally reluctant to give out any information about the boy's location. With Samantha uttering six chilling words, don't worry they won't be hurt. But after several more hours of interrogation, the girls finally reveal the address of the home just 11 minutes away. Sunday, December 6th, 22 Harvest Street. Nico and Ani are bound in a bedroom, being guarded by one of their captors, who's been dubbed the caretaker. The rest of the masked men are shooting up the house, and Nico is terrified that a bullet is going to pierce the wall and kill him. They've been held hostage now for 40 hours, and Nico is losing hope that they'll make it out alive. Eventually, the gunfire stops, and he hears the sounds of a football game on TV and smells a strong odor. The kidnappers are enjoying Sunday night football, smoking and laughing in the next room. Suddenly, one of the men bursts into the room, he's not wearing a mask, and starts untying Nico and Ani. Just as he struggles to release the binding, a huge bang is heard outside the house, along with violent shaking and bright blinding lights. The front door of the house is blown off by a SWAT team, who are hurling tear gas canisters to draw everyone outside of the home. Dozens of heavily armed officers rush in, splitting up in different directions, and two suspects are arrested on scene. Officers then begin searching for more. They go past the kitchen, walk up to a closed door, and kick it down to find the two missing students, and Nico is especially in bad shape. The two boys are then rushed to the hospital where Nicholas Kalias undergoes intensive surgery. He has several blood transfusions. A titanium rod is placed through his femur, and glass is surgically removed from his eardrum, scalp, and skull. He proceeds to spend the next 25 days in the ICU. As the investigation continues, detectives find a deeply disturbing video on one of the kidnappers' phone documenting the horrors that these men went through. And this grisly footage will also be shown at the trial. Over the next month, all nine of the suspects involved are arrested for the sadistic crime. Five take plea deals, including the two women, Leah Gigliotti and Samantha Hughes, who had lured Nico and Ani in on that fateful night. Their sentence suggests 13 years in prison, despite many thinking they deserve much more. The four remaining suspects decide to take their chances at trial. Nico and Ani face their attackers at court and are forced to watch the recording of their experience. The jury sees just 30 seconds of the footage, a fragment of what the boys endured, 
but it's enough to convict the four remaining suspects. Three defendants are found guilty of kidnapping, assault, and weapons charges. They're then given 17 to 30 years behind bars. The fourth suspect is Lydell Strickland. The 26-year-old is not only a violent felon with a long rap sheet, he's identified by prosecutors as the ringleader of the crime. He's also the one wearing the skull mask, not just in the cell phone video, but on the surveillance camera withdrawing money from Nico's bank account. Lydell is found guilty of 31 charges and is sentenced to 155 years in prison and laughs when the judge hands out his sentence. Now at this point, you're probably wondering what was the motive behind this brutal crime? Well, the reason these boys went through all this torment was because Lydell Strickland wanted revenge. See, the twist in this case is that Nico's teammate Ani was mistaken for another player on the University of Rochester football team named Isaiah Smith. Isaiah was a well-known dealer and had actually used Ani's apartment for a violent drug robbery while Ani was away on Thanksgiving break. In retaliation, the masked men had gone after Ani, thinking he was Isaiah, and Nicholas just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Isaiah Smith is arrested for the robbery, but one of the coaches at the football program pays $15,000 to bail him out. However, he's eventually taken a trial where he's sentenced to 13 years in prison, where to this day, he still hasn't made an apology to his teammates. Nico Kalaya sues his attackers for $10 million, as well as files a civil suit against the University of Rochester. He claims that the coaches of the football program knew Isaiah was dangerous and was selling narcotics, but they had turned a blind eye because he was a star athlete. Simply put, they cared more about winning games than the safety of their students. To this day, Nico says this incident still causes him immense pain. Emotional pain from night terrors and anxiety in crowds of people, and physical pain from the damage to his leg. However, the nightmare he experienced on Harvest Street doesn't prevent Nico from running a marathon and graduating from the University of Rochester. Nico insists that he won't let what happened define him. He's dead set on making the most out of life and focusing on the positive because he knows just how lucky he is to be alive.